So getting this thing started, how would you describe what Lucid Mind Revolution is all about? Great question. I think it's just an expression of this individual revelation that we all share. And I've been working on my path, let's say, for a long time and never really felt like sharing. Actually, I've been away from spiritual communities for a long time. And um, yeah, but at some point, especially after Corona, I start feeling a little awkward just to sit as, as I normally say, sit in your samadhi. I don't know if people are aware of what that means, but there is this kind of blissful state that campaigns when you're meditating. What is it? Can you say it again? Sit in your samadhi? Samadhi, yeah. Samadhi. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and it's a kind of blissful state you can reproduce over and over. And in the sense of just, it's just resting awake. I mean, it's nothing necessarily <laughs> mystical or anything like that, but it definitely feels, it feels right. Let's say it's not a trance and it's not the, an hallucination. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, yeah, like deep sleep, but awake or something like that. It feels very well, very natural. Um, but I think the contrast between that and what was going on in the world start feeling very, I don't know, dissonant in a way, like, mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, it's, there's no point on personal gain in the sense of, okay, you can get to a certain point where you're just fine, but at some point, uh, the only way to go beyond that is, is to, to, from whatever you are trying to be of value to other people. And so that sort of, message started impulse started growing out the idea of of seeing how easy from my point of view from my understanding it's possible to avoid many of the psychotic situations we are in in the world yeah. in the sense of how much people are suffering from all kinds of like anxiety depression and in general just the the regular old human dramas like war like like political imbalances, the, the whole thing is, as everybody knows, the whole thing is becoming more and more unstable and intense in some way. So I think not just me, many people probably have been a, an answer to that. And in my case, it was a little journey on to how to start sharing what I do believe is another way of living and hoping that it becomes contagious in some way. But let's say I don't have any agenda or I'm not trying to listen mind revolution sounds like a big name or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it was just because it means a lot to me that words lucid because I for me something that was relevant in my path was lucidity in a sense of becoming lucid in dreams and things like that. Lucid is to me a word that sounds very, very relatable to uh not a peak experience, but I a, um, a sense of crispy awareness, of clarity, of things making sense, of being alive, aliveness. For me, it has a, a connotation like that, lucid. That's why I think that was an important word. Um, mind, because obviously it's related to, to the mind mostly. And uh, revolution, because that's also, uh, I think it's a word that to me makes sense because I think... Mm, trying to express the truth has to be some sort of revolution in the sense of like, mm -hmm. it's going to hit some walls in there for sure. And I think it was Lao Tse said something like, if everybody uh, agrees with you, it means that you're wrong or something. <laughs> some <laughs> saying around like, that's good. Um, so in that sense, I think revolution implies the idea that, that it's not just something else. It's, we're talking in here or I'm I'm trying to point to to an, uh, another way of living, another way of understanding, another way of of experiencing life. And as much as it could sound cheesy, but 
I do certainly, I'm fully convinced that in the bottom of everybody, there is only love. And mm -hmm. <laughs> there is only this, 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 we are kind of feeling like, an, like aliens in a strange world. We're just pretending that we are normal and everything is fine, but there is something in us that kind of misses uh, a contact with something that is beyond what we can express. So Lucid Mind Revolution is an attempt on cooperating with that. I believe it's some sort of like a global initiative in the sense that I, I don't feel that it's just me or anything like that. It's, it's, I think it's everybody who's trying to bring up a message of Let's say peace. Mm. All said. Yeah. So where does this all come from for you? How did you get on this wavelength? Or maybe in a general sense, how would you say we all get on this wavelength? That's a great question. Um, of course, I can answer in a relative way, the way people talk in the streets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I can, honestly, I think it was many, many things that kind of set me on track. I just, I think I just, at some point I was able to look backwards and realize that it was not just like one thing, one experience, but multiple experiences that sort of pushes me from, from strange experiences of my childhood that I'd sort of kind of neglected uh, for a long time. And then suddenly realized, no, wait, that can be, it maybe happened. <laughs> You know, it was, maybe it wasn't just my imagination because I still can't remember that. But also, I mean, if you want me to, there are many, many spots, but just as a general thing that comes to my head, at some point, my, and this sounds a bit dramatic, but it's actually the way it was. Um, when I was a teenager, my, my dad was at a hospital fighting for his life and, and I just wanted to read to him. And I just went through a library and just pick a book and turned out to be uh, a Castaneda book. I don't know if you're aware of Carlos Castaneda. Mm -hmm. But it's our books on shamanism, but also have a, a deep spiritual sense to them. So I just started reading this this book to, to my father. And as I was reading the book, I was just saying, wow. <laughs> wow. And yeah. I think that should be into, into a more active way of pursuing another way of living that's interesting wow so you probably would have never read those books if it wasn't for your father going through it absolutely that's i wasn't reading it for myself the funniest thing is that i thought when i picked that book is because i heard sometime i overheard my father having a discussion with someone about castaneda and i thought my father was just interested in it but it seems to be that when he regained his health, actually, he luckily he was just uh, it was a sepsis. It was a very it's kind of a dangerous infection that spread. So it was it was definitely something serious. But luckily, he just recovered from that. And the funny story is that while well, I was completely hooked on it, and I read all Castaneda's book like many times, and my father actually told me, no, actually, he was he was he was in the in the discussion. He was arguing that that. Casaneda thing is just bullshit. <laughs> 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 so it was kind of ironic to know later on that the books that I was reading to him actually he wasn't very excited to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> but hey, you got something from it and that's what matters. Yeah. Yeah. I think the interesting thing is that sometimes we get the best ourselves when we try to give the best to others. Oh yeah. And I think that's that where 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 it makes sense to instead of living in this setup we are kind of going through in life, like go on your own, uh, like a man on your own, like you have to survive, you have to get your stuff, and everybody else is on their own. And I think that set us in a path of of trying to receive all the time. Like people are trying to, for example, in the spiritual community, people like trying to manifest stuff, you know, trying yeah. to. And in the general sense, people are trying to get rich, trying to get this, trying to get the other, you know, as if, as, if, as if that's the way to be. But as much as I do believe we can experience abundance, I think this is an important part of conversation. I think it's like one of the, if not one of the greatest upgrade we can think 
we can we can make is this idea that the most valuable things in life are not things that you measure in science mm. are not things that are so objective and that is what drives our lives let's say happiness love I and mean, put it whatever it's just there's no way you can actually measure that in any way i mean we have some some references in our brain or in our body or certain behaviors you can say this or that but ultimately we're talking about something what everybody's looking is something pretty pretty abstract and i think it's a very meaningful thing to notice because while we i hope everybody discovers in their personal practice is that what we're looking for is not stuff. It is, it is something, let's call it something. And the funny thing is that it's close, let's call it happiness. It's close to impossible to become happy by trying to become happy, by trying to get the stuff, by trying to control the world, by trying to control even your mind. You know, it's just, just very, on itself, everybody who tries, you can tell. It looks like it, but it's like this carrot with a stick. It just feels like you're almost yeah. there, but it never really is like that. And the funny thing is that in the other way around, instead of believing that the world has something for you that you don't have, if you turn the whole thing around and you start just through the act of, as we were discussing, to wishing to someone else something good and you just try to do your best to to help this person or accommodate this person or make their life or get a smile from them you know something yeah. just just interested in the other people's gain let's say and it's ironically on that giving that you give it may be mostly i would say maybe your time and your intention and your energy and your your thinking and i think that's the most valuable from everything I meaning not just giving money away or things like that which i think I, of course there is it's an important uh, part of helping the world that I'm talking about the personal stuff you do with the people are around you. So it's not that you give money to people, you know? It's more like you listen to a friend. It's more like when someone you think they're not fine, you just, just show up. It is by these little things that in your giving away from yourself, you find that, ah, <laughs> for example, that love that everybody's trying to, to pick from someone, as if someone will give you love, it never happens. No one ever gives you love. It's an hallucination. You just give it and you only feel it when you give it. Yeah. And it's ironically in that sense of I care for all the people that you suddenly find that that where you're hoping that the world will give you suddenly by giving you personally in some way, you just, just find that it has been always there. It's something that is, you just have to tap in you and it's just, just growing out of you and that's the way you experience it by by giving it rather than going around like a beggar in the world trying to ask for hey give me love give me attention give me money like me you know this thing but what if you like people <laughs> instead of trying to be liked mm -hmm. sorry yeah uh, yeah well that's good go on we want what we can't have right and, what do you uh... think about that I'm sorry if this, I don't know if this is supposed to be one way, but uh, yeah. I'm, I'm really curious to, to know what you think about that. Um, well, I think that was well said, first of all. And I think, on, let me try and calibrate my thoughts here. I don't really have anything else to say to it, to be honest with you. Okay. I just agree. It's, um, it's hard to explain, but it's like, it really just comes down to like being able to see yourself greater than yourself and then the more you give out to yourself which is somebody else the more you get back to yourself and the ironic thing is that at that point you don't even really want anything for yourself so like the more you the more you give the more you get but it's because you don't want to get anything right it's a sort of a joke but you, yeah. you understand what i'm saying it's like the more you absolutely yeah, the more you're selfless, the more, in a way, you get back toward yourself, which is, you know, your your yeah. sense of separate self. Absolutely, I I I I agree. I think the only thing that that's why that's not more popular is because I think I we take it in the wrong way. For example, I was raised uh, in a Catholic environment, like the school was Catholic. You know, my my father was an atheist. So it's not that like I was living in at home, something like that. My mother was Catholic, definitely. But um, 
in that context, you clearly see that how people try to be to apply this thing we're discussing, but in a superficial way. Like mm -hmm. you are an animal and you're trying to give stuff to another animal. Mm. And as much as this is obvious, this also it's also part of the process in the sense of please by any means help anyone that you think you can in the most animal way, you need like like physically giving them stuff. The reason why people don't buy into this is because uh, yeah, that sounds like a poetic thing to say, but if I give everything I have to other people, I have nothing, you know. Yeah. And that's what I think most people why most people don't really go into that. That's what I was trying to to say, uh, yeah, wait, wait, we're talking about different things. We're talking about one thing is the is the the symbolic value of things. Another thing is what really means happiness and well-being to yourself. And that's the part that we're discussing that you can share and it kind of grows as you share it rather than you lose it because you gave it away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think there's a essence of faith that comes in, faith in the process of servitude where you worry less about if I give all of this away, what am I going to have? And mm. obviously it's easier said than done. You know, I'm not out here giving all my possessions away, but just um, a little bit at a time, you will start to notice that you're always taken care of. With that selfless attitude, there's something that you can call it God, maybe. God always mm. takes care of you. If you're truly unconditionally loving, you just naturally taken care of in that sense and um yeah i think it, it's just faith right would you say it's faith that comes from this this wavelength this scene funny 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 thing i hear many many valuable humans talking about faith like yourself right now but for some reason as much as i understand it when when i try to express it i don't use the word faith so much maybe maybe that's one of the conditioning of my catholic upbringing like <laughs> yeah there are times blind don't faith. have necessarily. I, I just maybe changed the, the. I had so much about you have to have faith in in a in a man, manipulative way. Yeah, you know, like you have to have faith in the sense that you have to believe in stuff that is doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, I like, get that. You have to have faith on health, on on hell, and you're you know, this whole thing. You have to believe something just because I tell you. So maybe I do have a sort of unconscious connotation about that. So that's maybe why I don't use the word faith. But when you were talking, the word that was coming to my head was trust. Mm. But I think it's a different side mm -hmm. of the same story. Mm -hmm. And thinking about someone maybe hearing us and saying, are this guy deluded? Or or maybe right, I don't know. If they just you're you're they just say, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a try. I'm maybe gonna do something something for the sake of all the people's well being. And I think what you I think you were describing as faith. Into my experience, it feels more like fearlessness. Like, like saying, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's give it a try. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> you're yeah. not afraid of losing, let's say. And I think, I think I come from a creative environment. So, creativity for me in my life is, has been a thing that I nurture a lot. And it's one of the most important things in creativity to be spontaneous and, and you need to be ready to let go of everything you thought it was just for the sake of finding something new. And you don't know what's going to happen. You're just moving towards the unknown. And I think when people are attempting to to maybe grow and, and as I said, maybe out of this thing we're discussing or maybe try to say, what if I, instead of spending my day just trying to 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 fight for myself, to get more of this, get more of that, and my future, my goals, and my thing, my 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 time management. What happens if you just give some time to other person, for example, you know? And I think this this little bit requires, as you were describing it as faith. But I will also would say I see it stands up to me the fear of losing what you thought you need, like reaching your goals and all that. And so there's this moment that say like Okay, I understand it will be this person needs me. This this let's say a colleague or family needs your your attention, your time for whatever reason they're in trouble. But you say, no, but it's very important for me to get to, to this productivity thing and my boss or I don't know, whatever's the, the, the excuse sometimes we use, like, no, I, I'm too stressed for 
worrying about other people. <laughs> I'm just mm-hmm. trying to manage my my chaos, and everybody's got mind, minding their own business because of that. Especially, I don't remember where do you live, but big cities are normally like that. People like you could just some people could fall on the street, and maybe nobody would do anything. Yeah, in some way, you know. So, and I think there is a going back to your question. There is a sense to me of 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 a playful sense of what if we try it? What if you try to be a nice person? What if you try to be, you say, selfless? What if you just give it a try, you know, and just risk your our precious goals and our precious features and our, our precious me controlling the world? And just for a second say, what, what if I just open to the circumstance and, and actually care at least as much as I care for my feelings, I care for other people's feelings. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when you do it, I feel as though you come to find that's what life is about. It feels good. So in that way, it is selfish because you're doing it because it feels good for yourself. But you're also serving the world. It's a two-way street. It's a win-win. It feels good for yourself and it feels good for yourself. And then one starts to realize like, oh, this is what it's about. (laughs) It's not all about me. I mean, it is all about me in some sense, but the me, like I said before, extends a little bit further out. Yeah, and it's this uh, beautiful dance. You know, it's this beautiful dance of your of your expression of yourself to yourself. And you're bringing up a very, very, very important topic because I think our language and the way we use it, it, it implies some assumptions and limitations. For example, you're describing us, my gain. I'm gonna, you know, this thing of being good to others. So I'm going to go back to the religious example. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think most people were motivated to give money to the poor or do these kind of things because they kind of feel pride about it and they feel that they will go to heaven or something like that. So, um, but you were adding another layer, which will kind of turn around the meaning of me because when you were saying yourself as others, then suddenly, uh, so you feel good all the time? Or maybe you feel good when other people feel good. It's, it's, suddenly the experience has become a bit more strange in the sense of what is me. And yeah. suddenly you notice that, that, for example, I have, I have a theory. I'm not a psychologist at all, but I'm talking about, uh, talking about my experiences with depression in the sense of my mother was de- depressed for most all her life. And, and also the people around me and some friends. And from my direct personal experience and my attempt to, to, I realize that I always say this kind of funny way of saying it. I hope it doesn't hurt anybody's feeling, but I think the, okay, I'm gonna try to phrase it in a way that it's not misinterpreted easily. I think that the best antidote to depression is actually caring about others. Mm. Because in every circumstance, I try to help someone who was, let's say, being in this frustrating paralysis of depression, you know, where they were like, a compl- I think it's some sort of like a contradictory forces in their own mind. So they stop and they just kind of freeze. And they mm. become like, their minds start just like um, fantasizing about why they feel the way they feel and, and they start feeling powerless and victims of everything. You know, there's this, there's a specific side of depression. I'm not saying that it's all about it, but I'm saying that my personal experience I found out. So I normally say it to my friends in a very, very intimate, direct, and they know how much I care for them. I say this because I don't know how it sounds when you say it online, but I tell that you cannot be depressed if you care about others. Yeah. So in I mean, some not, way... you, Go Let me. You cannot be fully depressed in the sense of being clinically depressed, in the in the sense of someone who would be like really, really, really down. But I mean, of course, you can feel maybe certain frustration or certain kind of sadness or certain kind of uh, apathy or certain kind of different range of things. A depressed person, meaningless sense. Of course, you can still feel it, but as you were describing, it it suddenly things just magically start making sense. Even when you then cannot express it with words, but in the moment that you start caring about things around you, not necessarily you all the time, suddenly 
most of the logic that supports depression in one person's mind suddenly start being the foundations start just cracking because if you start actually caring for other people, many of the reasons why you normally express that you are a victim, and suddenly it starts just blurring away because you start discovering that you are very powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's so simple, right? We're talking about yeah. it now, and we know, we both know what we're talking about. <laughs> we're preaching to the choir here. And uh, it's so simple, but it's the truth. Selflessness. Yeah, I think many people may be listening to this and, and sometimes now that I'm, I'm, I'm starting this journey with YouTube and you just sit in front of the camera and say things, I think many of the things, when I hear my words and I hear the way we express ourselves, sometimes I say, this, I'm, I'm pretty sure like, I don't know, a huge amount of people watching are gonna like roll their eyes like, oh, I heard that before, you know, it's like. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, I knew that. Why should I be listening to you some way, you know? Mm -hmm. But. Yeah. That's, I think that's one of the, the strange times we're living in is that the, the, it's, not, it's not hidden, it's not secret, it's not something you haven't heard before, it's not, it's not a new information, it's not the, the, the revolution, it is just to, to be aware to, and to notice that, as we were discussing, there are these things that probably many people have been introduced already on this this idea of give to the others and then you yeah but who does it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and i and i hope that the the meaning for all these conversations to have as much as sometimes we we may sound like things that many people said before us i think the message is still relevant and i think is there is relevance there is people like us having this conversation again that many people had before us but i think I'm always hoping, I was thinking of the new generations. That's actually the reason why a bit of jump on YouTube, because I do believe I, it's a certain characteristic innocence in, in, in young generation, in, in young people, that I think it is worth doing anything to, to help them keep that innocence through life. And I think, yeah, they're going to see in the world a lot of fucked up things mm -hmm. and they're going to experience a lot of things that oh my god they're not worse for it they're going to feel themselves as we're discussing in depressive moments they're going to lose people they love they're going to find a lot of things in life that are going to be apparently just just hell and yet i hope that they remember because if you look to, look to i have a little kid and so if you look to children and how they play and how they live you know this wow there's this natural thing and they are of course they have their their stuff going they're also people but they're just simpler so in that way you can also appreciate the the innocence more clearly they don't have so many layers mm. and sometimes you notice that they win they they, they they love you just because you are there mm. And and yeah. I think that's something that as adults we kind of lose. So I think I would like maybe to find a way of giving reason for people not to lose hope on 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 doing the right thing by mm -hmm. saying doing the right thing, doing the thing that feels good. Not that feels good in a pleasure sense, but feels good like you work yourself out, you took the wrong decision, you don't know what's going to happen to you, but you just know you did the right thing. Mm, and I yeah. think that's a very important message in a world where, where people, again, seem, there seems to be no ethics. I think some people will say, oh, it's a problem that it's not religion, but it's not, there's no, many people don't have, they don't have integrity. Like there's a lot of people out there thinking that, who cares, you know, mm, <laughs> everybody yeah. on their own, who cares if there is all the people dying here and there, it's just the way they were. We, we become insensitized, insensitized, how you say it? Uh, insensitive? We, insensitive. We become insensitive by exposure to these kind of uh, horrible things that happen in the world, we become insensitive to them. And that's a way of defending ourselves, but we got into some sort of um, depression because obviously nobody likes, nobody likes war. I know there's some people who are very motivated to <laughs> pursue that, but still, even that people, if they given the real freedom to choose between 
peace and and staying with their loved and doing whatever they feel like doing, whether it's, um, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I, I live in Berlin, Germany. So I'm actually, my, my basement is a few meters away from the Museum of Terror. Actually, I'm on the ground, very close to where the SS had their 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 headquarters. Wow. Like literally, like it's just, when I come here, I was like, okay, that's a little creepy. <laughs> but I, I mean, in, living in a city like this, you learn to to live with this this kind of reality, pro reality of this is the world we're living in. And as yeah. much as we want to be spiritual or we want to be hippie about it and peace and love and the people say, yeah, but this, this is, look what happened, you know? Mm. And I don't know if you know, but Hitler was a art student. Oh, yeah. And I think that's kind of joining to the point that I was trying to make. What would have happened <laughs> yeah. if that person in that given time would have found a better way of spending his, because this horrible massacre and this whole horrible thing that happened in, in this country, well, in a huge chunk of the world, uh, it happened because some people in the two sides of the war, everybody's thinking they're doing what they have to do to defend their loved ones and yeah. to defend their, their, their value and to defend the truth and to defend the, the, the most sacred thing and to defend the higher values. That's a funny story. Everybody thinks they're doing it right. So I would say that, that everybody's still looking for some way for, for this sort of rightness. It's just that sometimes if things go wrong, it can go really wrong in the sense that someone, I don't believe, I know some people may disagree with this, but I don't think there are bad people per se. I do think, I'm going to say it in a more modern way of saying this. There is a TED talk that from, um, I don't remember it was, uh, well, the, the guy was talking to a scientist. It was a research um, I don't remember if it was a library, an institute. Uh, anyway, they were doing research on making brain scan to people in jail. And the interesting thing is that it came out that people in jail have dysfunctional brains, which is a very difficult ethical thing to consider <laughs> because suddenly, uh, to which extent they are victims of even a physiological thing, I don't know, mm. we will still need to discuss how that thing happens and how you, but it, for example, just in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the line of how you react to people being, doing bad things, is instead of seeing it as people are just bad and some people need to just to be put away or as in some, some places, they said, let's just kill them. <laughs> I was like, yeah. there's nothing to do with them. What, what about is suddenly we discover that, no, these people are just, just, just become unable to feel, unable to, to, to really actually uh, think in, the, in a reasonable way, in a, in a meaningful and, and sensitive way. They lost that capacity. And that, interestingly, probably, as these people uh, show, it's probably even we're able to prove that. But it will be probably, I think the reason why this is not more popular is because it will imply First thing, people jumping their own judgment on stuff, which is very uncomfortable. Who are we going to blame if there's no bad people? Yeah, right. <laughs> They're suddenly going to feel like, oh, poor of your boss that screams at you every day. Poor of him that he doesn't have a functional brain. You know, nobody wants to go there. <laughs> I mm. want to say, no, that guy's an asshole. You know? <laughs> I don't want to see me as a, as a part of a process that is just like an, uh, a, a consequence of maybe someone who has been beaten down when he was growing up, you know, and there's always, most of the time, there is some kind of strange um, um, environment for these people. So I do believe, going to the other side, that when people do meditate and when will people, as we were, for example, discussing, I think, I do believe that caring for other people is an active way of meditating. Mm. And by that means, we recover this balance in the brain. And I think it will definitely be a nicer world when people will start thinking twice about what they're looking for which is let's call it happiness and how you get it so i think the teachings from the buddha or, or actually any spiritual teacher 
who've been trying to make the point that you're not going to find happiness in the world per se. I think it's a very relevant point because it's, it's, it's the whole base for the delusion of, of, of trying to get things. And that's the way we get to hurt other people directly or indirectly. Mm, yeah. Well said again. I think this whole thing that isn't a thing that we're seeking is always trying to be found in the world. We're always trying to fill the void, fill our cups with something or somebody or some experience or some accolade. We're trying to fill it with something in the world and it never, never works. We all know that. Yeah. That's the thing too, is we all know that it never really works. We always get what we want and then a day later we want something else or we never get it and then that leaves us in more of a void. So it's just this hamster wheel that we seem to be on and I think it's just because people don't know any better that this natural sense of peace um, is just hidden in plain sight. It's innate, right? It's literally here and now. It's in the moment. And it's about not needing anything. It's an unconditionality to life, essentially. Ironically, it's completely opposite to the world, right? Yeah. Jesus has a saying. It's like, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but he's, yeah. you know, he's saying this world is not mine, essentially. And that's kind of what you have to see. It's like, there's nothing for me in this world that's going to truly yeah. bring me to this state of happiness, for lack of a better world, a better word. So, mm. yeah, I think that's the essence, man, is that this, um, this perspective is so natural, but it's not from any kind of, it's not from the vantage point of anything of the projection, right? It's not like anything that we project. It's, uh, comes from where the projection comes from. It comes from inside the projector. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, man. Yeah. But it's a funny, funny thing. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's a funny thing. Because actually this morning I was making a video and I was exactly going to the point that you were going. And I was going down the line of, of I think, part of, because we're discussing, there's this simple truth that everybody knows and everybody is aware of. And yet, for some reason, it's kind of difficult to turn into your default mode of acting and relating to the world. Yeah. And, and I was trying to make the point uh, in the video that first thing we have, I, I, I will split it in this way. We have two reasons why we don't, we avoid to, to really cooperate with this sort of wisdom of knowledge that let's say everybody has some way. And there's an external and internal side to it. The internal side is our mind. Because we got into a sort of dynamic where we got to, my way of describing this is it's like, you know, when you, when you get to play a, a table game with your friends or something like that, and I hope everybody has experienced this moment where someone gets too deep into it, like too emotional on the game, you know? Yeah. And you would, you, so you just narrow down yourself down to this m tiny part of you, which is the role in the game. And you start just like fighting with your friends <laughs> mm. for something that is not even anything. And you know it. <laughs> you're an adult <laughs> and, you know, and yet there you are fighting with your beloved ones for some silly points in a game that is going to mean nothing after half an hour you know yep. and yet we get into this kind of like and i think in that's kind of sort of what's happening to us in the sense of our mind is tricking us to into i don't know if it's a an accident i would say it's absolutely an accident i don't think anyone would do that on purpose yeah. or consciously. Mm -hmm. So it's just something we just get along and we don't realize uh, that's how probably, um, probably when you, I think going back to, we were mentioning talking about kids today and, and you know, sometimes kids do mistakes. My kid did a mistake today. And you can see how they don't know what they did. Mm. They didn't really think it through. So if you, you help them to think through, you realize that, oh my God, I did that. You know, so, he did it, but in a way, something he didn't want to do. And it may take him a few times until he actually completely get it. But, but I think it's, uh, it's a very meaningful thing to stand beyond your personal standpoint of your defensiveness and your reasons why you do this thing, that it may be actually horrible for other people. 
Yeah. Not in this case. It was just a silly kids thing. But nevertheless, uh, the point I'm trying to make is we trust our minds more than we should. <laughs> Meaning everybody is just thinking that, okay, every thought that crossed my mind, I should be right. <laughs> I'm going to have an argument with anyone who thinks differently than me. And, and we, if you, if you would, that's where actually you asked me about the channel. The, action, the channel goes about, I'm trying to cultivate the culture of meditation in people and try to show in a practical way, although I have to speak for it, but I have to, uh, to show that how meditation actually undoes all these things we're discussing. One of the most interesting experiences, which is not going to be easy, I think, for most people, but it's crucial, is this what we're discussing, your capacity to stand back from your own thinking and realize what's going on. Because if, you, if this is already very uncomfortable, that's why people don't sit to meditate at first, because you, people see it and realize, wow, my, my head is full of crap. <laughs> it's yeah. restless. And I can hear my crappy thoughts even louder. I don't want to, I feel bad only, only just by thinking the thoughts that I think. So I think it's a very uncomfortable situation to, to put that mirror of just sitting and, and just watching your own mind. And of course, it becomes a complicated thing. There's a part of you who are observing your mind, but that's another part of your mind. And there's this other part of your mind that's like, there's this whole kind of strange experience anyone has by watching your mind. But at some point you realize that that sort of, we are just following some thoughts and some imaginations that are completely unrelatable in terms of logic or truth. Mm -hmm. So they just fall apart. If you don't, it's like a, it's like a game. The game I was mentioning before, it's like a roll. It's like if you stop, it disappears. So in the same way, when, when you just start like just, just opening from your mind, then you see how your mind starts becoming more evident that what you're thinking, it just doesn't make any sense. Like let's say yeah. it's been like hurting, hurting someone or going over someone else to get what you want. Let's say some, some scenario like that. You really listen to yourself. <laughs> Like really listening to yourself, like where it's so useful for many people to go to talk to a psychologist <laughs> or write in a diary. It sounds like a silly thing to do, but it's an incredibly powerful thing just to reflect your thoughts and just see, own what you're thinking, you know, just like see what you're thinking in, in a paper, you know. But of course, it's way more profound and subtle to really just being able to monitor moment by moment what's happening in your mind. And the point I'm trying to make is your mind doesn't want to cooperate with this whole thing we discussed before. Mm -hmm. Because we have developed this character in the game, which is not really us, like in the game, in the table game with the friends. Yeah. It's not really, it's us in a way. Yes, of course, it's you in some way, but it's not really you in the sense that, okay, you are this role in the ga table game, but you're way more than that. And there's way more than that. You cannot just punch a friend of you in the table just because he got a point more than you. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. something like that, you know? And, and, and so we need to uh, narrow down. So our character, our mind is, is, is conditioned by this role, by this, by our history, by our memory, by your thinking, by our culture and conditioning. And that our mind will always try to kind of trap us against the other people. So I think that's why it's so important to understand that part of the problem. And then on the other side, you will see how, if you observe our society, you will see how everybody wants your attention <laughs> mm. you know i was today i was making a video about the bandas and i was making the point that it's even dangerous for a government to have people who are satisfied <laughs> you know mm. in the sense of for our organization of our society it's kind of dangerous that people will say i'm just fine the way i am <laughs> i don't need anything from anyone <laughs> you know i can just yeah. just get my stuff and I, I do my gardening and or i'm just fine with whatever i have i just 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 sweep the floor in somewhere and I get some money with that money, I buy milk and I'm just enjoying my life. You know, that's, that's sort of dangerous for our culture, right? Someone oh, says yeah. that, they would say, yeah, 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 go in, you're going to wrong place. <laughs> Something's wrong with you. You should be ambitious. You should be like, and this is because we have grown this, this, we're constantly stimulated by this sort of interest of everyone who is, everyone is playing with this little me's, this little uh, characters. And we sort of all agree, okay, let's be, mean to each other <laughs> let's yeah, right. be selfish let's be because and everybody has to be because you suddenly you are not you're threatening not, not just the people around you, you're threatening the whole system and that's why you were mentioning jesus before this is a great example of how he just said something like he was the son of god that right that was the thing that got him killed 
But the same with Socrates, for example, and anyone who, who honestly tried to convey the highest truth in words, it pisses off a lot of people. Yeah. And it should go against the system some way. So probably there's people talking truth nowadays. They, down the line, they're probably going to have trouble. And many people are not going to agree with them. Mm-hmm. And they're maybe not going to be very popular in social media or something like that, you know. But hopefully there's going to be people who appreciate and notice and can feel where they're coming from. And at some point, we have to be honest and understand that, that we need to find a better way and the first thing start with not doing grandiose things like we are pushed to do through movies or through stories and and through everybody's telling us you should be great like everyone sees you and say, wow, this person is great because everybody respect them because they did something that is very special. You know, yeah. we, we, we are we're pushed to believe that you have to be like that. And so funny story, you feel bad with yourself. Mm hmm. Because you never really get to be that special person, <laughs> yeah. really, you know. And, and in that sense, we're trapped in this matrix of, of feeling always that we don't have enough. And we never have the faith or the courage or the, the fearlessness trust. or the trust to, to actually say, what happens if you just bah, mm. let go? Mm-hmm. What happens if you suddenly just... Give yourself away in the sense of instead of being a little person trying to, like an animal, trying to get your stuff. What if you just just become part of the universe in the sense of go through with the flow and just just see what happens and just go along with discussing on, on actually it's not so, it doesn't require faith in the sense of, of it's going to be good sometime in the future. Now, now it's really bad, <laughs> but one day you will see. No, it's not like that. In that sense, no. That you know it in the moment you do the right thing. There's something in you that knows it. So the difficult thing is to keep focus on that part of you and don't listen to the other voices that come to tell you that you're stupid, <laughs> you're an idiot mm-hmm. because you mm-hmm. gave away your opportunity to be special and to be recognized and have more money and finally have everybody appreciation. So that's I think in psychology they will say that's a way of projecting the simple idea that. You were just wishing that your parents would love you or something like that. It's just wow. such a basic childish thought in the end. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, man. You summed it up very well. This viewpoint, this wavelength, this whole perspective we're talking about is quite contrary to anything of this world and anything that the ego mind will tell you. It's, um, it's like a constant battle. But the thing is, it's like once you tap in and you know, you can easily see through the illusion, right? It's like the metaphor of the matrix and the red pill. Once you take the red pill, mm-hmm. you don't go back. Well, you do go back, but you can always know that it's the matrix. <laughs> and uh, that's the thing, man. It's like once you tap into the real, you know that this is this is it. This is it. Hiding in plain sight yeah. all along. This is it. And it's true. It's um, yeah. getting back to the game analogy. It's like you start to realize that... Uh, you're playing the game. Oh, I got lost in the game again, right? You start to yeah. take a step back and you see that you you weren't the role that you were playing in the game. You are the one with your hands on the controller or your hands on the chess piece, whatever it is. It's like you're the you're the uh, you're the game itself as well. Like you're you're all of yeah. it. you're the role, you're the player, and also the other players in the game too. I think that's what you can come to realize with this viewpoint. It's like, well. I'm in this game, I'm of this game, but also there's other players and it becomes less of a competitive game and more of a cooperative game, right? Exactly, exactly. But that takes, you need to stop nurturing the other software in order to be able to operate with this other. They are opposite softwares. You cannot just do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And that's, yeah. thank you for bringing this topic. I think it's very important the one you're mentioning because I do believe there's a lot of people out there who call themselves awake. And in, the, in a sense, it's true. As you were discussing, when, once you taste yourself beyond the limits of what you thought you are, something cracks. And there's, never, there's no coming back, yeah. going back from there. And yet, the funny story is that I think most of the time, as we come from this momentum of an ego or trying to be special, 
I think the first reaction when we have this experience of of of, of being a danger for the other software, the, the selfish software. Yeah. When he when he goes back, this software does something very smart, which is to turn that experience into yourself. Meaning that that I mean, if you read sometimes, uh, sometimes I read the comments and all the videos, and you hear all these people talking about awakeness, uh, uh, being awakened, and I think even the, there's a generation right now that they call themselves the awake really generation. I don't know to which extent it's related to the thing that we're discussing, but I'm just saying that this idea of waking up to a, a new reality from the matrix, I think it's a positive thing. And yet, I think there's a conversation to have in this context with these awakened people, yeah. which is, okay, there is a, there is a famous, famous uh, book that says, after the ecstasy, the laundry. <laughs> And yeah. what that means in, in this context is like, okay, you had an incredible experience. You know, I know so many people who had these psychedelic experiences and, and, and you may have definitely just meditating or you have just many different ways. Okay, you had a crack in your system and you come to realize something bigger than your mind, let's say. You know, suddenly there is a crack. That the game starts there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, before that point, it was completely sleep state. But okay, at some point you sort of wake up for a brief moment. And what happens right after this wakefulness? And we tend to think, I am awake. <laughs> uh-huh. yep. And we're back into exactly the same spot or even worse because we think we did something special <laughs> and we should be uh, respected and, and we should be appreciated because we are awakened. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. It was a certain knowledge that we feel that we have and other people don't have, you know, the, the whole thing is that becoming exactly the opposite mm-hmm. of what the experience itself it probably was. And I think this is a very relevant conversation because I think we are living a time where there's many people who are awakening in many different ways, many of them spontaneously, I believe. Actually, it's always spontaneously. <laughs> you never really choose to do it. But anyway, there's some people who are exposed to this. Okay, there's the way, but I think they suddenly turn it around and turn into a problem again. Yeah, and as much as this this is something that finally I'm special, finally something very special happened to me, or finally I feel that, and you feel it in your body, and you feel it in your in your your, you know, something happened to you that felt very very special, mm-hmm. and very transcendental, and you want to keep you make it yours, you want to make it part of your identity, you want to, but the problem is that soon enough you will notice that if you go that way, it will never come back. And I think that's the spot where probably many, that's my guess, many people who watch these kind of videos or, or the videos I make are in that spot. They sort of know. So that's why I talk to them in a very direct way, like your, your happiness itself, your, this whole kind of direct way of talking. But at the same time, I think it's a very important conversation to say, yeah, but after you have this sort of like, I expanded to the whole universe and suddenly, you know, this kind of grandiose side of the story, the real deal, if you go to a monastery, if you see what Buddhists have been doing for thousands of years at this point, and, and if you really appreciate these traditions, there is, it is fascinating to see. If you want to go down there and see how they actually do work, what is the thing they do? And these people are way more accomplished than, <laughs> than, than, than the average person who is just suddenly just having a glimpse on, on a different way of seeing the world. These people have been nurturing that like like devotedly for 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 decades <laughs> like, for lifetimes maybe <laughs> yeah they're, they're giving they're giving everything they have for it meaning like it's the most committed version of someone awakening you could have and yet yeah. when you see what they do you will see something very ordinary mm. and i think that's beautiful and that's what i like mm. Taoism, the part that I really love from Taoism, that that the great enlightened master is a shoemaker <laughs> mm-hmm. you know it's not this great teacher, spiritual teacher. No, it's the guy next door. Mm-hmm. And that in my life have been my experience. And that's one of the reasons I mentioned before that I left a lot of spiritual communities because I didn't feel that I was just, just, there was, it was the spiritual community sometimes are attracting the opposite. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and one of the things is this thing that I, I looked for teachers, authentic teachers, 
I looked for authentic and like I looked for the best that I could find. And I found some very remarkable beans, let's say. But the, if you ask me, I would say a huge extent of them were ordinary people. Mm. They weren't a someone who you will notice. That's why I, I really like that point on Taoism. Like just just don't make any preconception of what it is to be enlightened or what is to really fully, fully, moment by moment be awakened. I mean, don't make any assumption about that because literally it's impossible to think about it. So and I think it's a I think it's a beautiful story to realize that in the end of the day, some way everybody is enlightened sometimes not enlightened awaken i think mm. i make a bit of a distinction there although i don't like neither both words i think are misleading in general mm -hmm. but i'm just using them because people use them and i think it's my point is that after you have all these grandiose experiences and if you have a conversation with sometimes you will just just drop your jaw by the experiences all the people had really and when you see what they're doing the pros as i call them they are actually humbly having the most normal life ever. They're yeah. not trying to be noticed by their accomplishments. They're not, they don't feel special about it because feeling special because you've been awakened, that's not being awakened. Mm. So there's this humbleness and humbleness uh, in the practical sense, we're discussing about other people. Well, having a job, it is, it is, it is humble. Having a job is a forced way, <laughs> a medieval way of forcing people to be sensitive to other people's needs. So that's why you get paid. And, and, and most people living in this sort of matrix of capitalism, you would say, are, are dreaming of being free from this capitalism, being independent, financially independent, and just being, I think everybody who has suffered some sort of sense of, of you didn't have enough money or, or you didn't feel free, we, you automatically have this, this, this illusion of, of, okay, I wish one day, I imagine one day, what if I had enough money not to work anymore and you not know, to be, to have been committed to do something that I don't really want to do. And, you know, I think many people understand freedom as doing whatever you want, whenever you want. And I think that's another point that I would like to make in the, the line that we were discussing. We go back to the beginning of the conversation. Freedom is not doing whatever the fuck you do whenever you feel like doing that's like a wild animal you know <laughs> right no yeah. it is it is it is actually being sensitive to other people's needs and the ironic thing is that i do believe if people i not say it's everybody's fault uh, it's, as we discussed before it's also a contextual fault our culture our parents with all their love in their heads they were trying to create the best life for us and they just just throw on us some very wrong fearful beliefs about ourselves and what how to navigate the world in terms of like making a career, making money and all this. They just, they train with the intention of keeping us protected, but actually that actually create more, 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 more suffering in the long term that it may need. But I, I do believe everyone has, if everybody will be more interested in other people, we'll start focusing on other people's needs. I know this sounds like anarchy, <laughs> but mm. I think ultimately, if people would be awakened enough to understand that it's not about you keeping your body safe and comfortable all the time, but, but just being, being proactive and cooperating with all this thing that's happening around you, like indulging in feeling how other people feel great because of something you gave them or something you, you helped them with, you know, the indulging on that thing, you naturally become a necessity in society. And I do believe, and this is just, I'm not a capitalist in that sense, but what I'm saying sounds very capitalist. I do believe in a way people will appreciate when someone is really honestly devoting their life for well-being of others. And, and if you really commit it with that, which is the only possible line of action if you really awaken, Yep. Because you don't mm -hmm. consider yourself limited to your body. So naturally you start caring about things around you. Mm -hmm. So if you start going down that line, I do believe you were discussing how God provides. Well, a very mundane way of saying that is it's like you when you are really giving something meaningful to people from the bottom of your heart, whatever it is, whatever are your skills are, whatever is the thing you can do. And it could be the most the most common thing. It could be working a 
in a, in a, in a mall or any kind of shop. And you were just, just honestly, from the bottom of your heart, just noticing that when you wish people a good day yeah. with an honest smile, that could actually turn around people. who get, People get in the line and they're kind of like ah, rumpy stress. And then you just honestly look at their faces and just, just be, try to be nice to them. And, and they turn around. How powerful is that? And, mm. and you can do that from the most ordinary jobs in the world. And I think someone understanding that power, being in a position where you're doing apparently a job that is not well paid, you will become someone very, very important in the community, let's say. And, and the people who are normally in touch with you, people will follow you in the sense of the, we, we want more of that. Wow, a person that is actually caring about me. It's that becomes, so I do think part of this God taking care of yourself, not in a magical way, not in a manifestation way, although it definitely happens, but in a way that is unpredictable and unexpected and kind of coincidence, kind of base, kind of strange things happening. But I'm, I'm taking a, a very ordinary way of saying this. If you were really well-intentioned in your interactions, the people around you are going to want you more and more. Mm -hmm. And if you become in indispensable you say you become yeah. if people start noticing that that they get something authentic out of you that, that you would just you have to have enough to make to live in let's say in a decent way because that's some people will argue okay if you start just doing you go around the world you start giving yourself away then you don't have anything you're gonna live like a dog in the street or like a monk without having any possession you know no no we're not talking about that we're talking about Whatever you do, whatever you're doing in your life without trying to be something different, just whatever you do, just do it from the perspective we're discussing, what you are exchanging with other people is the best of you, your full attention, your full caring, your, your best wishes. If we interact like that, I do believe that person will start becoming more important and clearly seeing how probably even other people start coming, suggesting them, hey, can you help me? Mm -hmm. I, I will, I will, I will pay you if you, if you, if you help me. You know, it will start happening naturally, not because you're doing it for money, but we're talking about this idea that you need, okay, you need to pay some expenses if you want to have a family. You, you cannot just go all hippie. I'm gonna go to meditate for ten years in a cave, and I don't care about the world. And this is an illusion. No, 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 no. On the contrary, I think awakening in this context means a very you 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 said the word cooperated cooperative yeah, yeah at some point mm -hmm. great that's mm -hmm. a great word it's it's not like you're passive it's not like you're necessarily proactive in the sense of trying to make things happen but you're definitely spontaneously interacting and just trying to go for for the most natural way of proceeding i'm extending too much <laughs> <laughs> Which, what's that? Are you explaining too much? No, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, man, and that's freedom. You just explained freedom right there. It's freedom in the process. We are in and of the process. I, I do. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you, you're trying to follow that because I think that's another great point. People talk about freedom. Why do you want freedom? It seems to be so natural, but what do you mean by freedom? Most people yeah. mean by freedom um freedom from stuff mm. in the sense of they are denying they yeah. are reacting and in that way you obviously get trapped what someone mm -hmm. said what you resist persists i don't remember who actually originally said that but it's not the law of attraction that was before that um what uh, so the sense of freedom when people many times i think when they say i want to have money to be free that's a very average uh, common thing probably most people will understand most of the time what you really mean is something else money is just a way of expressing it but the freedom that you want when you say money you just don't want to feel certain things you felt feeling that you couldn't let's say provide your family or you couldn't really get certain things you don't want to feel frustrated like that again so you you, you say you want to be free so you assume okay so freedom must be the opposite of what i have but i think that's a trap obviously that keep us pursuing a freedom that never happens and i would say that true freedom compared to i think the the common 
definition of freedom goes about it, I would say it's freedom from your mind. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because that sets the whole thing into, I think, an unexpected turn for many people. If you never, I think you did, and probably many people listening to this will know, will have done their work, pretty sure. Definitely someone who haven't probably have go so deep into the conversation for sure. Yeah. But people who are right now at this point, listen, they, 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 they did their work and, and, and they appreciate how profound is the idea of not attaching your identity to the thoughts that cross your mind. That's yeah. a revolution. Mm. That's the most revolutionary thing anyone could ever do because that's the last thing you do to start with. <laughs> mm. You know, you stop, you stop taking thoughts, your own thoughts personal or as the ultimate truth or something you should be just caring so much about. Mm -hmm. That just, that creates a kind of freedom that it comes to my mind, Eckhart Tolle, in the sense of when you get out of your mind, there's this sense of, of presence, there is a sense of nowness. There's this sense of, and I think that's a, a valuable point to say, okay, what do you mean by freedom? I'm saying not freedom from this, from that, not freedom in the animal, animal way of having so much rice that you could go through the winter. <laughs> I'm not talking in that sense of freedom or having so many uh, 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 sexual partners that you will never need to, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. not, not that, 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 that kind of freedom. I think most people, when they think, what is freedom? And you have this, we have this idea. Like, no, freedom in the sense of all possibilities on the table. Mm. Freedom, freedom to fully love whatever it is. Freedom from, freedom from yourself in the, this little character of the game. Yeah. And free to let go of everything. Mm. So apparently, I think it's it comes to my it comes to my mind, um, Babaji. I don't know if you're aware of his work. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and 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 he, I like how he emphasized this idea: you have to just desire one thing, <laughs> because this whole thing in the spiritual community about desiring. Oh, should I be feel bad because I desire to be with other person, or should I feel bad because I desire the money? So I desire is that a bad desire? Because that's what Buddhism say, let like, or and uh, you know. Yeah. Now he said like, no, no, you just. You just have to be very focused on your desire and you have to put all, all your desiring thing into the real deal. I mean, if you, uh, if it would be an investment, you, you put all your money on the, on the, on the horse that's going to win the race and that is happiness. And if you, if you do that, if you reframe all your desires to actually happiness, you will quickly figure, find out where you are missing it out. Like in mm -hmm. which behaviors and with which patterns you are just completely missing it. Because that moment, the moment we get angry, the moment we get sad, the moment we, we normally justify in something. So if we will be very sensitive moment by moment that we are really up for ultimate freedom and, and permanent happiness, let's say, if we will be sensitive enough to moment by moment do that, you will click quickly see when you're departing from that. Mm. Yeah. And if you will be able to observe your mind, you will see how quickly you're getting into personal bullshit justifications of why you should hate this other person or why yeah. everything is wrong or why you should feel angry at someone or why you should be sad because you don't have something. I don't know. All this range of emotions are very easy to, to pinpoint if you are fully devoted to, to the ultimate freedom. And ultimate mm -hmm. freedom is freedom from everything, even from yourself. Mm -hmm. Hey man, I think that's a good note to wrap this up at. Okay. <laughs> we're a little bit over an hour and I know we're on a okay. roll, but um that's perfect. That's great. Nice. <sighs> Do you have anything else you want to say? Mostly just thanking you for thanking you for I was thinking, wow, who's this guy who I'm just YouTuber, I just started I think last the other week. I don't know. I don't do it I don't count really the subscribers or anything like that. I don't have these typical YouTuber goals, but uh, you constantly see YouTube tells you how many subscribers and it tries to encourage you to have more. But it surprised me that that you just right away 
wrote me and said, wow, who's this guy who would write to someone who's nobody? <laughs> We're all and nobody. Would be, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, but in the sense, you know, in the common sense, you know, someone who makes interviews many times, you are just, just I think people are relying on people who are on the range of uh, of the of the interviewing thing. So you, people try to network and to, that's the general yeah. thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I said, wow, it just it has to be someone with an authentic intention to, to, to connect with someone like me where mm -hmm. I'm just starting. I just have a couple of videos up there mm -hmm. and, and saying, wow, that's a meaningful message that I would like to, to bring into my own podcast. So I, I just trying to say that, wow, that's, that's, that's meaningful to me. It means a lot to me that you enrolled me and you invited me to participate in here. And I definitely most enjoyed talking to you. Well, I appreciate you coming on here so much, man. It's only possible because of people like you. And on the note of subscribers and popularity and clout, none of that really matters. And none of it really matters when it comes to self-realization, especially. I've had better conversations with people that have hundreds of subscribers rather than hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And that's the beauty of me being able to do this is I can pretty much talk to anybody and have these conversations recorded and this wisdom that is uh, timeless in a way. And that's my goal is to come on here with people that just know something that I don't know, <laughs> quite essentially. And then, uh, yeah, kind of extract information, extract a little bit of knowledge and uh, hopefully other people join me on the journey. But yeah, the point of the story is that popularity means absolutely nothing in this realm. And that's the beauty of it. So yeah, I do think you're going to be very popular in the future though. So keep up your great work <laughs> and and uh, yeah, keep doing your thing because you definitely have a way with words. Um, and that's all I got to say, man. I really appreciate you coming on here. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, thank <laughs> you so much, Gary. For sure. And uh, yeah, thanks to everybody that listened this long. I really appreciate you as well. That's it. Peace and love. Peace and love to the listener and peace and love to you, Ricard. Is that how you say your name, Ricard? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right. Thank you, Gary. That's it, everybody. Okay. Have a good day. You too, man.